Hey everyone, thank you for joining for today's great challenges discussion. This program aims to engage all of you in conversation about some of the most complicated and difficult public health issues our society faces today. A grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation makes this program possible. Today we really want to dive into two of the great challenges, making prevention popular and reducing childhood obesity. I want to focus on real world, initi real world initiatives here, uh, the community level initiatives that might be able to be scaled up and, and discuss programs that are out there. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Allison Aubrey. I'm food and health correspondent at NPR News here in Washington, D.C. And uh, by way of disclosure, NPR receives financial support from the same foundation that funds this great challenges program. My, partic my participation here today is unrelated to that. At NPR, I have reported extensively on childhood obesity and nutrition, so I'm thrilled to moderate today's discussion. To get started, uh, we're asking for your participation. On social media, you can tag your questions with hashtag great challenges. That's hashtag great challenges. And I'll direct them to the participants. We've gathered a great group here today. So let me uh, allow them to introduce themselves to you now. Karen? Hi, I'm Karen Peterson. I'm at the University of Michigan School of Public Health where I direct the Human Nutrition Program. My work focuses on understanding children's growth during what we call sensitive transitions where we know the incidence of obesity rises fairly dramatically from the womb to infancy, early childhood to school age, and then during adolescence. And I'd like to look really at the intertwined role of behavior, biology and environment, including toxicants like obesogens during those periods. I've also done a lot of work and I'm very interested in the topic today on design and evaluation of interventions focusing on diet and activity in children and very much interested in organizational characteristics. How do teachers and staff and other people who care for children implement evidence-based programs? Thank you. Risa Wilkerson? Hi, Allison and everyone participating. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, my name is Arisa Wilkerson. I'm the Marketing and Communications Director for Active Living by Design. Our organization creates community-led change by working with local, state, and national partners to build a culture of active living and healthy eating. We've consulted and collaborated with more than 160 coalitions in 30 states, dozens of national partners, and a variety of philanthropic organizations it gives us a unique perspective of community-led change from multiple levels. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Belinda Reininger. Good morning. I'm Belinda Reininger. I'm uh, representing Brownsville, Texas, which I'm proud to say was the 2014 Culture of Health Prize winners, one of six communities in the U.S. to win that prize. I am here to talk really about the collaboration and the efforts that have gone into becoming the prize winner. We've really focused on an evidence-based program being implemented uh, entitled the Community-Wide Campaign. It's one of the strategies uh, promoted by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and it's focused on increasing physical activity and healthy food choices in and in our population among Mexican Americans and we're pleased to see an increase in number of people meeting physical activity guidelines, some increases in healthy food choice, particularly around fruit and vegetable consumption, a lot more collaboration, an increase in the funding that we're receiving, collaborative funding, and overall just a, a, a focus on health in our community. Thank you, Belinda. Dan Butner. Yes, I'm a National Geographic Fellow. I write extensively on longevity. I led a 10-year project uh, with National Geographic to find the parts of the world where people live the longest, distill them down. And uh, currently, and to the point of this program, I lead the Blue Zone Project in 20 cities in America. And we effectively try to optimize the environments of these communities so that the healthy choice is the easy choice. Uh, we started in a place called Albert Lee, Minnesota, where we lowered health care costs among city workers by about 40%. And now we're in places like Fort Worth, Texas, uh, Los Angeles, California, and the whole state of Iowa. And I take a pretty disruptive approach at public health. Excellent. Uh, Angela Diaz. I'm Angela Diaz. I'm a physician by training, pediatrician, and I specialize in adolescent health. 
I'm the director of the Mount Sinai Adolescent Health Center, a program that provides integrated physical health, sexual reproductive health, mental health, info, and optical services to young people ages 10 to 24, all for free here in New York City. And relevant to today's discussion, I'm um, a partner in a um, place-based initiative, a uh, population base that we are beginning in East Harlem. And we are at the very beginning of that initiative. So I'm really looking forward to um, today to learn a lot from the people that had had such success doing this type of work. Okay, thank you. Well, welcome to all of you. So we want to keep the questions coming to our experts. In the meantime, let me sort of set up the conversation here. We've all heard the the phrase that it takes a village, right? The question is, how does this uh, how does this phrase "it takes a village" um, apply when we're talking about combat combating childhood obesity and promoting wellness and, and prevention? As the CDC put it, working at the community level brings the greatest health benefits to the greatest number of people and helps to reduce the gaps caused by differences in race and ethnicity, uh, social status, income, and other things. So let's get right into it. Let's talk about, in particular, some success, some success stories out there. What makes these models successful? Can they work elsewhere? First, we have Brownsville, a community that recently won, as you just heard, the RWJF Culture of Health Prize. It's located in the southernmost tip of Texas, bordering Mexico, and has one of the highest poverty rates in the nation. In Brownsville, about one in three residents has diabetes, 80% uh, are obese or overweight, and the childhood obesity rate is, is really quite high. Uh, we will also be looking at, as Dan told us, blue zones, the areas of the world where people live the longest. In cities across the country, the Blue Zones program is altering the way people live and trying to work to improve their health and increase longevity. Community leaders are working to uh, change city policy, restaurants, workplaces, schools, anywhere where we can reach people. And the members of these communities are challenging their lifestyles, um, hoping to live happier, longer lives. So uh, there's a lot to discuss here. And remember, bring in your questions, hashtag them great challenges. I'm going to send the first question out here to Karen. You're our nutrition expert today. What impact does a community's way of life have on levels of obesity? How can conditions such as childhood obesity be addressed really at the community level? Uh, thank you so much for that question. So I wanted to share first in public health most of the efforts that have been mounted by CDC and others um, look to prevent and manage child overweight and obesity by thinking about different layers, layers of influence, if you will, around the child. What are the, the ways in which we care for children? So in order to get to the community, we actually look very first at um, what are the, who are the people around the child? The parents, peers, family, teachers, those are the ones that can most immediately influence imbalances in what in energy intake or what we eat as well as energy expended through physical activity or perhaps not expended with too much screen time. Then we move out a layer so we, we need to think of all these layers at once from the community perspective and look at the um, people who are embedded in organizations. So that means public health is always in most of the successful community-based interventions looking at the home the connection with schools and child care settings. And I would term these and others in the field do behavioral settings, or you could think of them almost as micro environments where parents, teachers, daycare providers implement obesity preventions and policies. And then finally, these organizations are parts of communities. Thus, the interface between community and the organizations is very, very important. And community policies, as well as community resources, including the resources supplied to schools and other settings, um, along with access to healthy foods and safe opportunities for physical activity and active play, are all important in understanding obesity. And looking very broadly at the types of programs that have been successful nationwide, there have been several great reviews recently. They typically use some building blocks we call evidence-based behaviors. These are central to uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's approach to childhood obesity prevention. Then uh, looking at evidence-based interventions, what has worked before. Then typically, a couple more points, the programs that have been successful in the community, then put those pieces together. So they may start in a school or they may start in a child care setting, but they're going beyond the school day and they're going beyond the school yard. 
then how the work is done, and I think my other colleagues on the call will speak to this, is incredibly important. So the success stories are really unfolded within a broad framework of community participatory research or uh, other approaches that bring diverse partners and voices to the table. Thank you. Risa, next question to you. Um, we all hear about the built environment. Our actions aren't just a matter of our, uh, of, of our own doing. Our societies influence a, a lot about our health. What do you, um, when it comes to active living, what role do you think the community has in really sort of trying to create the right environment? Yeah, thanks, Allison. I mean, really, communities from large to small, urban to rural, can improve their neighborhoods, parks, and streets to enhance health. I mean, people can only be active if they have safe places to do so. So it really doesn't do much good to go tell people to take a walk if they don't have a nice network of sidewalks in their neighborhood and a safe environment in which to walk. Um, and so when people can integrate physical activity into their daily routines, and what I mean is if you're going to the store or to the school, being able to walk or bike there rather than take a vehicle, um, when, when they can do that, it's easier to achieve the recommended amount of movement and other benefits. And you also are building a sense of community and many, many other benefits derive from that as well. Um, and so, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead, finish. No, that's so. That's that's really. I mean, if we think about it in terms of built environment, the the way that the the community is structured makes a diff big difference in whether people have access to opportunities for physical activity or not. Belinda, you're here representing uh, the Brownsville community. We heard a little bit in your introduction, but tell us what results um, have you seen so far? That's a great question. We we. So I'm a partner with this whole effort um, with the university. I would represent the University of Texas School of Public Health. So it's been a nice opportunity for me as a researcher in the in the coordination, in the um, efforts, in the collaborative efforts to provide that type of resource. So we do a lot of different approaches to our evaluation because we're implementing different programs, we're doing different approaches to our evaluation. So, for example, if we implement uh, a trail, then we're doing counts on that trail, seeing how many people are using it and what type of activity are they doing. If we implement a program, particularly for youth, then we're looking at both the parents and the behaviors and the changes that they're seeing as well as what's happening for the children. And the good news is across the different types of programs we're seeing, we're seeing the expected behavior changes. We're seeing more movement. We're seeing better food choices among our children. We're seeing seeing um, some changes in their, in their waist circumference and their weight, uh, particularly for children, as, as we're talking about today, it's really important to, to see if they can maintain that current weight and then let them grow into it. So they just stretch right out and it's a, it's a wonderful approach to keeping them feeling good about who they are and, and, and then moving to that healthy weight. So we're seeing more people being physically active. Um, and then, you know, I, I do want to mention, because we are such a low-income community, there aren't excess resources for anything that we're doing. And so for us, being collaborative means not just in the way we program or do policy change, but also in the way we seek funding. And we have a lot of partnerships around that, and so people have to put in a little bit here and a little bit here and a lot of volunteer efforts, and so we're also seeing more funding come to our community that then uh, results in change. Got it. Uh, Dan living healthier, longer lives sounds great. Uh, as our Blue Zones expert here, can you tell us a little bit about the model of community health improvement you've got going? How does it really work? So if you look at the uh, people who are reaching age 100 in these Blue Zones around the world, uh, they never try. Uh, they don't get on a diet. They don't uh, sign up for an exercise program. Uh, longevity happens to them. It is uh, uh, it ensues from their environment, and um, so what we try to do at the city level is make sure we have all leadership signed on. We don't come into a community unless the mayor, the city manager, the superintendent of schools, uh, the head of public health, all understand that we're there really not to try to change individual behaviors or beat the horse of individual responsibility but rather kind of engineer their environment so the healthier choice is the easier choice. 
and then we'll bring teams in at three levels at the policy, the food policy, built environment, and tobacco. We've aggregated a bundle of the best practices and we arrange them like menus. And you don't want to go into the community telling people what to do because it smells like nanny state. But if you give them a choice between positives, you can often unleash uh, a, a will to make a healthier uh, environment within certain political agendas. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, small armies on the ground that will visit every restaurant, every grocery store, every school, most of the big workplaces with a checklist that will make that those environments 10 to 15 percent healthier by, again, changing the defaults, setting up nudges, uh, not relying on guilting people or incenting people. You just make their environment so that the, um, uh, the culture makes the right decisions for people. Got and, it. Uh, it's working. All right, small armies. So these are blue zone armies. These are blue zone staffers. Are these local people that you're engaging as as peers in the community? Who who are the people going in that you mentioned? In well, it, it, well, my company sort of like the architecture firm, and a, a bigger company, a population management company called Healthways. They're the ones that are implementing in all these cities. And uh, Fort Worth, for example, we have a team of 20 people on the ground. And we typically work with um, the big insurers like Wellmark of, of uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Iowa, HMSA of Hawaii, uh, Texas Health Resources, and and they're actually taking this uh, Obama uh, Affordable Care Act uh, component to heart in investing in making people healthier as opposed to just making sick people less sick. And uh, it's really one of the, one of the first efforts where these bigger companies are putting their money where their mouth is in generating health. Excellent, Angela. You're at the very beginning stages, as I understand it, of trying to transform a culture of health in East Harlem. Tell us about your plan and tell us what is the first step that you're taking. Yes, I know. With a grant from the New York State Health Foundation. Us at Mount Sinai are working in collaboration with the um, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene through the Fund of Public Health, the New York Academy of Medicine, and the New York City Planning Commission. And we are developing a process that will engage all community stakeholders, including residents, um, the city agencies, the not-for-profit, the for profit, all the leaders within the community to really increase availability of healthy foods and decrease availability and promotion of unhealthy foods. We are also working to try to make the public spaces safe and for people to have access so that they can use them to congregate and to really try to be active. That's what we are trying to, to achieve. And we have three uh, goals specifically that I would like to go over. One is that working together, all of us in the community, we want to establish a local wholesale food hub that will provide neighborhood bodegas and markets with fresh, affordable fruit and vegetables. Something else that we are doing is that with young people, people in high school and uh, young adults, we are walking through the neighborhoods, really mapping every single asset in the community. It could be a clinic, it could be a bodega, it could be a child care, it could be a beauty salon. So, so that really we know every single thing in the community and then we are making calls to really understand more deeply uh, what is it that these things provide? Because you may see a building and you may really not know, they may have like five different things, services inside. And how can the community best utilize them? And then we are putting that in a website that is open to the public. And eventually we'd like to connect that to, an, to electronic medical records. So we just don't say to people, you need to exercise. But we can say, you know, Given where you live, there are, these are places and things that you can do right in your community and connect them to that. And that is based on a um, map, map score project that has been done at the University of Chicago by Dr. Stacy Lindau. And then the third thing that I would like to raise is that we are doing um, participatory budgeting 
bringing the community together like in a town house, uh, a town hall, and then having a part of the money for the community to decide how do they want that, that money used. And that's based on a model that the New York City speaker, Melissa Mark DiDerito, has developed. And I think like that, the community will also feel engaged, involved, and that they are part of this process. I and mean, it's about their lives. So we are doing this all together, and it's very, very exciting. And I'm learning a lot from you guys that have been doing this for longer. So we've got a, a question from someone listening out there, watching out there. Thank you. So in the fight against childhood obesity, Whose responsibility is it to ensure that the children get healthy food? Uh, should that fall to the parents, to the schools, to the community? I'm going to toss this question to you, Karen. You mentioned at the very beginning uh, everybody needs to be involved, right? Yes, so I'll uh, take this chance to echo that. So within this multi-level framework, these layers of protection around children, it's really everyone's responsibility to work and work where they are, so in the home, in, the, in school, child care food service, and in addition to working where we are or where they are, to work with one another to get ensure children get healthy food. So uh, to, to underline a couple of the points I made earlier, we really want to understand how our partners and organizations, such as Head Start, schools in both urban and rural settings, we, it's uh, some of the research shows that in fact this can be a primary source of energy and nutrients and healthy foods for certain low-income children and sometimes is actually compensating for shortfalls as impoverished households may face challenges in obtaining healthy foods. And Belinda, uh, sorry, uh, Belinda, you probably have a few examples as, as well from Brownsville. Uh, when you started looking at how to get healthy food in the hands of kids, talk about the different players involved in, in this effort. Definitely, I'd be glad to. We. Again, there's a lot of partners that should take part in this, and 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 the way we like to think about it is that if it's you know seamless, if everywhere that child is going, they're seeing healthy options presented to them, then it makes it easier for them to make those choices. So, a, a few examples: we, what our local school district has done a, a very nice job of implementing an evidence-based curriculum that actually includes classroom changes the school um, PE environment as well as the food service and this is the catch program and so by doing that the food options are being changed we worked with the the school district as well to look at how they're arranging the food choices in in the cafeteria so that those healthier choices are a, a quicker grab a closer look and then in addition, we've done some programs, for example, where we've really promoted water. And so we we presented water, a little, a little fun discussion in the classroom about the importance of water. But then we've sent home materials to the actual home and the parents and talked about the importance of water. And then there was an incentive if the parents pledged to drink more water, the school with the most pledges got a hydration station mm -hmm. as the prize and the kids loved it. So, you know, it's, it's like creating a, a way to have a conversation about health between the children and the families. But I think these kinds of um, approaches can, can give us some good ideas about the number of people it really takes to make the healthy choices. Mm -hmm. Got it. Angela, you mentioned um, something interesting to me. You said that you're mapping assets and you included beauty salons. How might a beauty salon play a role in promoting health in an environment? Have you figured that one out yet? No, but I, let, let me say that I think beauty salons and barbershop and, and things like that where community congregate, you may have access to um, the population and go there and do health education, do demonstration of different uh, foods and things like that and engage people in the process. This is what we want to do in the community. We are going to have a town hall. Why don't you come to that? So it's a wonderful place where people are there usually for a few hours and they love to get engaged. And some people are using beauty salon to try to um, engage the, the community through that venue. And the same thing for barbershop. Um, to engage males and fathers and other people. I think there are wonderful venues to, to really engage the community. 
Uh, another question out there, a community can work really hard to try to educate people on diet, uh, how to improve uh, food access, but there's this constant barrage of, of junk food marketing on, on television. I am wondering, um, is there any way to take on the food industry, this is a question from someone listening out there, to drive change in how foods are marketed, um, especially to children? You want to take that on, Karen? <laughs> Let's see. Well, I could offer a, a few comments. Um, if we think back at those evidence-based behaviors, one of them is actually reducing screen time. So that's sort of a um, sneaky way to answer the question and really reduce not only children's sedentary behavior, but also reduce um, the, the literally the amount of time they hear advertising. And then um, somebody earlier, I think it may have been Belinda, someone else, uh, no, it was Dan actually, is the importance of really infusing the environment with positive, healthy choices. And then the last thing I'll say on this point, and I'm sure others may want to speak to it, is um, sometimes what we think is happening in the community may, may be different in different communities. So for example, um, we sometimes think there's a higher density of fast food restaurants where children would see more advertising in low income communities. That actually may not be true. It may be in higher income communities where children have more access. So um, that's another way in which children would be exposed to some of the food messages. Risa, uh, you want to weigh in here just about the extent to which the built environment might expose um, kids to more advertising of junk food? Well, sure. I mean, I really think it, it is a matter, it's a matter not only of television advertising, but what they're seeing at school, what they're seeing kind of in the groups that they're in and things like that. Um, whether or not they're going down the, the street and seeing a variety of fast food um, establishments which are advertising themselves on the billboard or not. Um, and again, it's really providing children the option. I was just sitting here thinking about very many examples when I've heard that in, for example, school lunch lines, when you offer them healthy food, children will often eat that healthy food, and um, you know when that's when that is what's presented to them, they'll make that choice. In in communities where we know children have um, participated in farm or in school gardens and community gardens, they're eating more uh, fruits and vegetables as well. So it is truly an exposure issue, um, and I do think that the issue of marketing is a difficult one because it's. Such, there's so much funding that goes into it, and we can, as Karen and others have mentioned, we can address it in many ways. And Angela, you mentioned, you know, you're at the beginning of this effort in East Harlem. What have you noticed so far about the built environment, about advertising to children of junk food? Oh, we see what was just mentioned. A lot of um, advertisement for sugary beverages and, and food that are not healthy. And I think sometimes you have to have sort of a two-prong, multi-prong approach. This is such a complex issue. You need some kind of legislative piece, like Mayor Bloomberg, our last mayor, and the present mayor, Mayor de Blasio, and our Commissioner of Health are very invested in terms of policies that really will lead to um, healthy food being available, but at the same time working with the families, working with the community, so, to, so just to help them understand why this is so important. And I think it's a public health approach and also individual approach, whether it's in school, the doctors, you know, kids don't become overweight just because of one thing. It's all of us. It's what is, you know, home, school, and community, poverty. So we need to all come together to figure out how really we make, the, as Dan said, the, the choices that are healthy. So the only ability to make a choice is the healthy choice for them. So it's, it's, it's really taking this from different angles. Excellent. Uh, Dan, question for you. I'm sure that when you take the blue zone into a new city, this is really, you're not the only person there talking about health. I mean, this is the issue of the day. Schools are talking about it at the, the you know, the federal level, the national level, the state level. Um, this is a conversation that's happening across many fronts. Um, and there's a lot of cross-sector initiatives here. Talk a little bit about, you, you mentioned already you've got partners through Healthways. There are a lot of uh, voices here, a lot of stakeholders. How do you ensure that you know every stakeholder, every party is being listened to, prioritized to make it all work? Well, first of all, if you try to do everything, you will fail. And what we try to do is uh, take aim at preventable chronic disease because that's about 80 to 85 percent of our health care spent mm -hmm. in this country. And 
um, if you can't uh, if you can't measure an effort, you can't manage it. Uh, stakeholders can't take credit. So first, we come in with Gallup, and we use their well-being index to take a complete snapshot of the health of the community. And then, much as I've heard in this forum, and, and there's a lot of great ideas. I think we're on the same page about making sure you find the like like-minded partners who are interested in having their success measured and get all feet walking in the same direction, at least in a, a three to five year time cycle. Because they're, they're limited resources and if they're kind of fighting with each other for name recognition or a uh, different initiative, it, it tends to muddle the water and, and just water down the initiative. So. Um, we try to come in with uh, a, a new idea that's been that's worked elsewhere, uh, measure it, get stakeholders who want to get the same thing done, and, and get all feet walking in the same direction for three to five years. And and we, we see we're able to deliver measurable results in lower obesity and 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 better health behaviors. Oh, excellent. Okay, so we have a question here um, in response to something that was just discussed. The, the question is, um, what are your thoughts on creating policies that would only allow healthy food choices in hospitals or schools? There are some schools around the country that say, hey, you can't bring in food from the outside. What's on offer here is what's on offer. Um, that's one approach to, to seeing the kids eat healthy in schools. Any of you out there uh, familiar with any of the, the literature reviews or the evidence on, on what it's like to, um, to limit kids' choices at school so there really is only the healthy choice? I can, go ahead. Well, we know that if there are no eating in classrooms and hallways, that occasions about 11% drop in the BMI of that school. The key, though, is that you don't force it in. Is you, you have to bring the stakeholders together, the parents, the PTA, the administrators, and you offer them the evidence and you paint a vision for them and you let them choose. And if it's right for them and they choose it, it can be hugely successful. But if you impose it, you're almost always going to get trouble. So where does that leave the role of peer influence? That's got to be strong, particularly as kids get older. Their peers are uh, so influential. Any programs that have looked at sort of peer-to-peer -peer support or peer-to-peer -peer programs, Belinda? That's a great question. Peers are very important and always, you know, always have been on a number of health issues, and, and what we choose to eat is, is no different. We've found that um, using role models is a great way to produce the, the influence and the motivation and the excitement around, around uh, healthy food choices and being more physically active. So we've engaged children over the years to be the, the leaders in different programs, to be the spokespeople uh, for different programs, and, and to recognize their role as a, as a, as a role model. Um, in fact, we've had a group of children who've worked together to talk with the schools about the food choices that they have available to them to as we you know across the country where there's been changes to improve the 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 quality and the the re reduce the calories to a certain amount of um, and the balance of food um, that is provided during the school day but making sure that the, that food is something that the children really want to eat is is another piece to that and so uh, some of our children have have stepped up to really talk about that Got it. I know that there's um, there can be a genetic component to conditions such as uh, obesity and, and diabetes. There was a study, for instance, from Harvard researchers several years back that found Hispanic kids were more sensitive to weight gain from sugary drinks um, than non-Hispanic kids. Given that, how do you account for these differences in community-based uh, prevention programs? Um, you can take a first shot at that, Belinda, or we can go to Risa. I'll be glad to just say a, a little bit about that. There, you know, when we look at the influences of behavior kind of across across areas and we take a social determinants of health approach, we really see that about 20% of, of what's made, what, what influences our health is genetics. But a bigger, a much bigger piece, or at least 50% of of what determines our healthy weight, particularly for children, is our health behaviors. So the the at level of activity, the amount of food we're consuming. So while certainly we need to take that into account, the genetics, we we 
in at least in Brownsville, we have so much to work on around the health behaviors that, that we'll, we've got a we've got a good amount of work to just do there to get those in line with guidelines and even to exceed guidelines, so we start seeing better health outcomes. Thank you, Karen. Do you want to weigh on, on in on this? Sure, I would. Um, Heartily, uh, second what Belinda said, that genetic variability is such a small proportion of obesity development. It's very important, but communities, I would urge focus on access to healthy foods, opportunities for active play, and then implementing and providing resources for implementing programs and policies in schools, child care centers, and uh, reaching out to parents. There is an interesting nuance here. Um, at the University of Michigan, we do a lot of research on epigenetics, which talks about how gene expression is regulated. So it turns out, this is a nutritionist dream, healthy diets, particularly early in life in the womb, can affect the epigenetic regulation of the expression of genes that are related to obesity and chronic diseases. And therefore, the emphasis on good nutrition, particularly for low-income pregnant women and young children, it becomes much more important. But if communities focus on changing behaviors, they'll take care of that epigenetic um, uh, expression of genes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, we've talked a lot about, uh, you know, you can't use the sort of nanny state, I think was the term you used, uh, Dan. Uh, education and persuasion are, are key to some of these community programs and prevention initiatives out there. What should the communication strategies look like for these types of initiatives? I mean, how can we can ensure that we're meeting people sort of where they are, uh, to, speaking in, in the language they want to hear that they're comfortable with, and um, you know, trying to gauge their own education and motivation levels? Do you want to weigh in on that, Risa? Absolutely. Thanks, Allison. You know, I, it's interesting to hear you talk about um, education and motivation. We, we, the Active Living by Design office was the national program office for the Healthy Kids, Healthy Communities initiative, which was 49 communities across the United States funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to reach children at greatest risk for obesity based on race, race, ethnicity, income, and even geographic location. So in other words, we were working with partnerships who were trying to address childhood obesity in low-income neighborhoods and with uh, residents who were, who, who were most affected. And I'll have to say that you know some of the most impressive um, work that was done was when residents were meaningfully engaged. And so not making any assumptions about how their education or it, uh, would affect um, their interest level in this work or what their motivation might be, but really going in, talking to them about their everyday experiences. Youth um, also would get involved and do what we call photo voice, which was take pictures of their environment and write what they're seeing, what they're living with, what they wanted to see changed. There are many ways to engage residents of all education levels in this work, and some of the really great outcomes came when residents were given leadership roles. So I just really want to lift that up, that we remember that it isn't just a bunch of sort of professional organizations trying to take this on, but it's really most effective when our neighborhoods and our residents are fully engaged. Got it. Um, I'm wondering if there's been any pushback in any of the communities where you've gone into work, Dan um, or Angela. What did that pushback look like, and and how do you handle that when when that happens? And and certainly any of you can can weigh in. Um, you want we can start with Dan. Well, we work in Iowa where. Uh, there is a, a, a very hardy pork industry and we come in with sort of a plant-based uh, uh, agenda. Uh, we, it's very clear that the longest lived people in the world are taking about 95 percent of their calories through plants, 5 percent through animals. So we try to mimic that in our, our populations. And um, for blue zones there are actually nine core tenants that seem to highly correlate with longevity and you have to be willing and able to subdue a certain message because at the end of the day economics are economics and if people's jobs depend on a certain industry it's really hard to fight that you just want to make sure that you have three or four or five other tools in your toolbox to approach the problem without having to depend on on any given given one and um, and then to the extent you can work with them 
And Angela, would you like, or Risa, would you like to weigh in on that? I, I, uh, this is Angela. Okay. I actually, we are so early in the process that no one had had the opportunity to push back. But something that I think is important, we cannot come into this community about changing their lifestyle or, you know, just like, we really need to understand and appreciate what is already happening in the community. So when we have, we, we still didn't have the first meeting with the community stakeholders, but what we need to do is learn what is already happening there, how can, what, what is it that is important to them, what is it, what outcome they want to see, how can we be most helpful to them, mm -hmm. and I think engage them, inspire them, and work together, um, I think that's the way to go, and we are hoping we're meeting with people individually and trying to really gauge everything that is happening, surveying everything that is happening, so that, that we can work collaborative with them. Got it. Risa, uh, given pushbacks, can you provide a, a, a different type of example? Dan mentioned uh, pork industry in Iowa. What other kinds of, of examples might you be able to provide? Yeah, so it's not really pushback, but it's really just um, it, readiness maybe as it may be. So, for example, in a, in a community partnership in Houston that was working on um, reducing childhood obesity, they went into one of their uh, in low-income neighborhoods and wanted one of the residents to, to help them figure out what policy or, or built environment change to make. And frankly, they just weren't ready to have that conversation yet. What they really wanted were healthy cooking classes. And so what, what our leaders there did was go in and, and meet with the, the parents who wanted those healthy cooking classes. And what naturally came about was talking about, well, where do you get your food? What food is available to you to make these kinds of dishes? And as soon as you went down that road, then they became more interested in the, the broader systems work that really is important. And became strong advocates for change and so not necessarily pushback but just being really sensitive to where people are and their readiness um, to, to engage in the work and then and then moving along with them and meeting their needs. I was recently talking to a, a food bank director who told me that they were going to have some cooking classes that focused on on making beans um, from the bag. He told me that when when clients come in, they're often looking for beans in the can, which is, is fine, but if you get them from the bag, there's a, there's a value proposition there. And they were sort of looking down on buying beans from the bag because they thought, I don't know, perhaps the, you know, the beans in the can were just more convenient. Um, maybe that's an example, and perhaps sometimes there's pushback that's based out of just a, a lack of skill or the convenience factor. Do you want to weigh in a little bit here, Belinda? Sure, we, we definitely see that the, the current generation of, of, of mothers who are providing foods have far fewer um, cooking skills than in the past. And we've, we've spent a lot of time working on not only um, community gardens and farmers markets to introduce the idea of, of eating locally grown produce, but then also now adding on cooking classes to, to show what to do with those, those particular um, items and I and I think that all of that goes back to that idea that um, Risa mentioned about go you know focusing your programming on where the population is you know a lot of times pushback can actually be no action at all right that speaks uh, that speaks volumes when you're trying to get programming started or policy change started and nothing's happening that's a that's a form of, of pushback and so for us we've been doing this work for over a decade now and and we just circle back, you know, it's like, <laughs> now's not the time, this isn't, we, were, we weren't getting any action there. We'll come back to that, because there's plenty of, plenty of work to be done. I want to switch gears here a little bit. Um, Dan, I love that when you were describing the concept of, of longevity, longevity and the people in these blue zones are not going on a diet, it's sort of longevity happens for them. And um, I want to bring up the issue of stress. We know that stress is a big contributor to conditions, uh, to health conditions, and we know that living in a low-income community is inherently stressful. So, um, how can how can the issue of stress be addressed in the community setting? Yeah, well, I'd first like to point out that in blue zones, Sardinia or Okinawa or Ikaria, these people actually suffer the same stresses that we do. They worry about their kids. They worry about their health uh, by uh, income level, they most of them live below the poverty line. Uh, what they have that we don't have are um, uh, cultural institutions that help them uh, on a daily basis uh, downshift, either through prayer, 
they tend to be fairly religious people through meditation, uh, through a habit of happy hour, uh, eating meals with their family, uh, institutions like that. They often tend to have a vocabulary of purpose. And um, I think that we could engineer stress out of lives of our communities by uh, promoting not just eat your veggies, but also promoting the notion of downshift, of nap taking. Uh, if you have a faith uh, in your uh, family, uh, revisit it. We know that um, religious people tend to be uh, healthier than non-religious people, or they tend to live longer. Um, and uh, making sure people understand what they're good at and what they're, they like to do and, and uh, nudge them towards volunteering which is a, a, a time-honored way to reduce stress, but also to lower heart disease and even health care costs. So it sounds like personal choices are sort of at the, the heart of some of those interventions. What about at the, what about at the community level? Are, are there things in the built environment that create stress that could be addressed? Well, noise, noise ordinances, um, we know that uh, uh, noise and sex are the two things that uh, humans don't uh, uh, adapt for, so uh, in different ways, of course, but um, uh, also um, the active living design, uh, Reese, I believe, was talking about that, that uh, uh, the faster cars go, the more stress they cause. If the street you live on has a speed limit of 45 miles an hour, you're going to be more stressed than if that street has a speed limit of 30 and there are half as many cars that you've lowered the danger level. So with complete streets or active living policies at the, at the city level, you can systematically lower stress. And uh, Risa, would you like to weigh on in this as well? I mean, there's safety. There's also, uh, you know, safety is tied to, to stress. If you're living in a safe environment, I'm imagining that it's a less stressful environment. Absolutely, yeah. And, uh, you know, in a lot of, of the, especially the low-income neighborhoods, safety is a big concern, and we heard that over and over when talking with residents and partnerships. And so um, another, uh, Dan's absolutely right, the, the speed of the traffic is, is certainly one of those things if you think about children trying to get to school and parents worrying about their children crossing very busy intersections and unfortunately we had stories of children being hit and killed on their way to school because of poor traffic design so that's going to create a lot of stress and certainly traffic um, calming measures creating safer walking and bicycling infrastructure will help that as well in addition crime is another factor that causes a lot of stress and um, there's something called SEPTED crime prevention through environmental design and so there's a whole field that looks at how our buildings are structured if there's windows on the street if there are bushes that block your view of things or not um, all of that kind of goes into reducing the um, opportunity for crime to happen and partnerships of co course with law enforcement are important as well so this back to this multidisciplinary partnership conversation and why it's so important to have so many disciplines involved so we can have all that expertise feeding this the, um, the solutions to these issues. Karen Peterson, would you like to weigh in on the issue of, of addressing stress? Yeah, I had a couple of points I wanted to make and I like the way you phrased the question really what can communities do and a couple of thoughts come to mind. First of all, we know there's a very complex relationship between stress and the development of child obesity, particularly in early childhood. And one approach, um, and one of my colleagues here, Dr. Julie Looming, leads this area, looks at early childhood educational programs for children and their parents to see whether you can actually teach self-regulation and healthy parent-child interactions. And of course those can, if they take place in a low income stressful environment, can have additional challenges. So these are, we're looking into whether these are an important complement to nutrition and activity programs and policies. And the other thing I wanted to mention that I think echoes things others have said is um, the importance of asking ourselves and asking people in the communities, what are the st stresses that specifically affect them? So on a research side, we might do qualitative research or focus groups. There's other ways to get that information. But just one example, in uh, urban Latina women in the Northeast, we did some qualitative research and what these women told us was it was access to childcare, transportation, 
as well as the immigrant experience and in their setting a lot of social isolation those were the major challenges they faced in obtaining healthy diets so not necessarily what we might put on our list but those three themes came through loud and clear interesting um, some people who are, are obese or overweight require medical attention to handle this um, people who have elevated blood sugar levels might be put into a diabetes prevention program to try to prevent um, the development of type 2 diabetes when you think about these medical interventions that are sometimes uh, used to help attain a healthy weight or uh, um, a, a more healthy state um, how do you account for these in a community-based initiative model? I'm sure not everybody out there who could benefit from a diabetes prevention program is enrolled in one. Is this a place where the community model might be able to take on or work more with uh, you know, individual interventions that are happening um, in, in, in medicine? And I'm not exactly sure who I'm addressing that to. Uh, uh, let's see. I can give some examples if you'd like us, Belinda. Yes, Belinda, so, excellent. I think that that's a, that idea of connecting people at the point where they may get some health information that says, you know, I'm not as healthy as I thought I was, I'm not invincible, and connecting them to community programs is an ideal opportunity and one that we're trying to capitalize on in Brownsville in, in multiple ways. So we have programs now where we are working with our federally qualified health centers, with um, local clinics as they're identifying people maybe with uncontrolled diabetes or hypertension and any of the conditions we might expect associated with chronic diseases. They not only now can refer to a wraparound program where we provide services in the home, we talk about lifestyle changes, we connect them to free exercise classes that we have built around with churches and schools and, and parks departments, and we have our own little army of, of community health workers, and I have to say I think community health workers um, who are trained uh, to deliver health messages it's just a it's a wonderful way to reach people in their homes with language and and cultural examples that are relevant and it helps them now make the connection between what that doctor told me in the office to what does that translate to in my daily life and and so our army of community health workers are out and about and we have one program that's serving over 1800 people and it's been through that referral process between clinics to in the home services. Interesting. So we've talked about uh, stress, we've talked about safety issues, uh, we've talked about transportation as an impediment to, to healthy eating. Building on, on these things, what are some of the other unexpected or unusual links that each of you has found when you look at this connection between community health and obesity prevention? Uh, do you want to start, Dan? Well, loneliness. If you meet the technical definition of loneliness, i.e. you don't have three good friends you can count on on a bad day, it drops your life expectancy by about eight years. So by finding people who A are lonely or B want to connect and connecting them in smart way, setting them up so you'll have a, you can have the strong possibility of creating a long-term friendship. Uh, we borrowed the notion from an Okinawan cultural co construct called a Moai. And we find five people who are interested in changing their healthy behaviors, and then we challenge them to either do plant-based potlucks for 10 weeks or walk together for 10 weeks. Hmm. And we find about 60% of them stay together. And you've just set up a permanent, cost-free health intervention that goes on perhaps an entire lifetime. Is that ha are those happening here or just in, you mentioned Okinawa, are you piloting that here as well? Yeah, we, they started in Okinawa, we piloted them in Elbert Lee, Minnesota, and now you'll go, you'll see them in Los Angeles, you'll see them in Fort Worth, Texas, you'll see them throughout Iowa, They're where we, our Blue Zone projects are. Interesting. Um, I, anyone else want to, to weigh in on that? Angela, you look like you have something to say there. <laughs> I just wanted to say that I want to underscore the fact that isolation is a major source of stress, as is interpersonal violence. 
So, and feeling just isolated. So if you can find a network, as, was, as Dan just mentioned, a network of people so where you feel supported, valued, connected, useful, where you can walk you know, in, in a given afternoon per week with other people, that's extremely important. And also um, in New York City, and, and it's going to be part of this project, um, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene just place community health workers in public housing to make those connections, not just to health and, and the diabetes program, but also if there's a pre-K program, are all the children that can benefit from that connected or not? So we are also doing that connection to different services where they people can attain and, and hopefully have better outcomes. Thank you. Karen, what is your example of the unusual link or the unexpected link that you've seen uh, between community health and uh, prevention? So um, when we've done some of our interventions in schools that are embedded then within the larger community, one of the things that really surprised me was the huge variability across communities and across schools. And it wasn't always possible to predict which were going to do best. It's sort of the community's analog of parents. Like um, those who are not the most well off may be the most resourceful when they are provided with certain level of resources. And one of the things that surprised me most, we're, you know, we're in the business here at the university of trying to understand why an intervention works. So one of our projects that was in over 100 schools in Massachusetts showed that the number one factor that explained the success of the intervention was actually whether the school put together a team and whether the team members met regularly and whether everybody was on the team. So for example, parents, teachers, a community member, and that explained most of the variability, even using fancy statistical models. So at the end of the day, it was how people work together. That is really fascinating. Uh, that's very fascinating. Thank you for that, Karen. And thank you to all of you out there for joining us today. I think we're running out of time. Um, if you have a question that we didn't get to answer today, we will not forget you. We will gather up the unaddressed questions with answers and post them to the TEDMED site. Uh, just check out the blog, which is blog.tedmed.com. And of course, we encourage you to keep sharing your thoughts through social media and with the hashtag Great Challenges. I'm Alison Aubrey of NPR News. The next Great Challenges online event on the role of the patient will be held on February 26. Thanks to all of you and goodbye everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.